calls me from the cold Just when I was alone Feeling short of stable All the chintons And all she keeps inside Is in the label She says she's ashamed Can she take the fall? Can I be a friend? We'll forget the past, and maybe I'm not able to break into bed. Here and now, will we ever be again? Cause I have found all that shimmers in this world is shown to fade away. She thinks she can make it Happy Friday. How are you guys doing today? Please don't leave us. What was that? I'm sorry. I said, please don't leave. <laughs> oh, I wish I could do both, but with this being a synchronous class, I, I can't because I have to work during the day. So unfortunately, that wasn't something I could I could do. I wanted to try to negotiate saying like part-time or something, but it really, I, I don't think we were able to work anything out. So I appreciate that though. Um, so let's see here. All of your stuff should be updated um, in terms of grades, unless you turned something in this week. Um, keep in mind your APA paper is due on Sunday. Um, somebody asked me a really great question. If you put my name or the teacher who's taking over, it really, it, it doesn't matter. Um, the person taking over, uh, Jenna Joyce, is the one who's going to be grading it. So it kind of makes sense to put her name down. Um, but you're not wrong if you put my name down. And it's probably easier to put her name down because um, you'll spell my name wrong. You would not believe the number of people that submitted papers last semester with my name, like, wrong, spelled wrong. And I was not nice about it either. I was like, oh, point off. Like, nope, you got spelling errors. Because, like, my name is everywhere in your course. It's in your emails. Like, it, it kind of cracked me up. So, um, yeah, either way. Um, <clears throat> I'm here through Sunday. So if you have questions, you know, feel free to shoot me um, an email and I'll try to get back to you if you have any like formatting issues with your reference page or anything like that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that's usually the hardest part in terms of the paper is just getting the references formatted correctly. So um, anything stick it out. Can I just clarify, so that paper that you sent out, the example paper, is if we like just insert our stuff, that's like totally correct format. We can just, mm -hmm. okay, perfect. In terms of like your headers and your title page, 
because the title page format changed from six to seven. So if you just use what's there, you'll be fine. Remember, no running head, just your page number in the upper right hand corner. Um, and then plugging in your resources. Keep in mind too that there's a percentage, your Turnitin score is associated with that. So if you have over 20%, you would receive a failing grade. So submit it early so you can check that. Okay, thank you. And you can make multiple submissions. If you wanna just check it out and see where you're at, then that's fine. Okay, okay, thank you. I just have one quick question. Um, so the professor that's taking over, is she just like a new hire or someone that's been with Joyce for a while? She's been with Joyce. I think she's in the DEMSM program, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but she has been here almost as long as I have. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to fix my sound because for whatever reason, let's see here. I have a quick question just before we get started yeah, about the paper. Um, so I noticed I'm like looking at the sample paper. Do we put like the assessment and then a paragraph and then diagnosis and then the paragraph? Because I noticed that you do do that. That's how it's formatted, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And also, in the diagnosis part, you can you know, we, we, the whole point of this paper is doing a care plan, but you're writing out the thought process is how, how you would do the care plan. So it's basically just a care plan. So you're not, we talk about diagnostics, but we also talk about that NANDA label. So why would uh, a label of impaired skin integrity work here? You know, and what diagnostics then would we do with that, you know, to get that information that we need? Obviously, impaired skin integrity is not the correct label, but you can't really go wrong, but that's the, that guy has no skin issues, so. Were there other questions? I was just wondering who's gonna do our reviews. <laughs> <laughs> he said that too. Um, so <laughs> the, the next review, is going to be done by either Professor King or Professor Kanan. I did do a Jeopardy and I gave that to them because last semester I didn't do that review, but I created it and the other instructor did just because it was, it's time consuming to do all of the reviews when you have other people to do it. So I don't have a recording from last semesters, but I, they do have the Jeopardy. And then the last review for exam five, the diabetes obesity one there wasn't a jeopardy I tried something else and it didn't work so well so um I'm not sure what they'll do for that one and well, then now I'm really final, nervous <laughs> be okay. we're, screwed. we're literally screwed no because no big deal you'll have the jeopardy from for this exam and then the diabetes and obesity one I'm sure if you search those Jeopardy labs, there are tons out there. And if you just did diabetes, almost to the point where it's like too much information because it'll be above your pay grade, you know, type thing. Um, and then for the final exam, the final exam review is done in class. So week 15, instead of lecturing, you guys prepare questions ahead of time and say, can we go over chest tubes? And then we spend time going over chest tubes. Whatever content you guys want to review, the review gets done in class and then it'll still get posted. Um, how your professor will post the, re the recording so may be different than what I did. So just keep that in mind. But the recordings are all still there. I'm not gonna delete it. It's there. Um, so you have access to old stuff if you wanna go back and listen to we talk again about stuff. Thank you for doing that. I have no use for them, you know, and it's honestly no difference than watch, watching a, like, who's that one Southern nurse that does the reviews? What's her name? You know what I'm talking about. She's got the Southern accent. She's real yeah. petite. Long she hair. always has winged eyeliner. <laughs> Which I can't do. I always, they always look like sisters. I don't know. Or cousins. It's always off. But yeah, it's no different than that, I don't think. So you guys will be good. Also, um, you know, utilize that CTL too. Professor Solace 
in the CTL used to teach this course, so she knows the content. So she is a good resource if she's holding review sessions or the other instructors just to get a different viewpoint or explanation. You know, certain things I'm I'm comfortable with and I love and other stuff, no thank you. You know, like I don't like neuro. No, I want nothing to do with neuro, but give me the kidneys or give me the heart and I'm happy, so. You guys will be okay. Sometimes change is good. And some, you know, there's people who are like, hey, she's leaving, woohoo, Ding Dong, which is dead. Whatever, maybe for you, change is good for you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know reading my uh my performance evals or the student evaluations from last semester like oh. what people had would be either really good or really bad but that's me in real life too you either I like can't me please everyone know. and I gave up trying a long time ago exactly well this semester we all really appreciate you so you were awesome I appreciate you guys too hopefully I didn't make anybody cry no maybe not you definitely not you <laughs> <laughs> all right um let's see here um and then you guys also don't forget you have your ati do this week as well which reminds me i need to do something with this where are my post-its uh, copy ati summarize Okay, so I'm gonna gotta send to somebody. All right then. Well, let's uh, let's get through this, okay? and uh, we'll do our last week of of G U uh, G I stuff. Um, so let me get this set up for you guys. Do -do 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 -do. I am gonna have to make a major change, so I'm gonna have to start getting up at like six in the morning. And the nice thing about you guys being in Utah is that it's an hour later for me. So I really never had to get up before like eight if I needed to. Not anymore. All right. So upper and lower disorders of the GI tract. Where does the GI tract start? In the mouth. So we're gonna start at the mouth and we're gonna work our way down. So jumping into the mouth, the mouth is disgusting, first and foremost. Uh, we got two primary diseases that we're going to talk about. And, uh, the first one being herpes simplex virus 1. These are known as Sarah said it, cold sores. So herpes uh, HSV1 is mainly transmitted through oral to oral contact um, through sores, saliva, or surfaces in or around the mouth. However, HSV1 can be transmitted to the genital area through oral genital contact and can cause genital herpes. So HSV1 and HSV2 are two different viruses, but we can have those HSV1 filled um, lesions in the genital area is what I'm getting at. So if it's open on the mouth, don't go down south. Um, HSV1 can be transmitted from oral to surface when we have symptoms, so we have a lesion present, or we don't. It is most likely to be transmitted when we have an open cold sore lesion, um, because if, even if we don't have anything on our mouth, we are going to shed the virus. So the likelihood of you transmitting it is very low, but we always say there is a slight possibility. So the greatest risk of transmission is when there are active sores. So before sore pops up, you're gonna have mild itching and then a painful vesicle can, will occur um, on the mouth. Um, the frequency of these sores vary from person to person. Um, common triggers are things like stress, illness, menstruation, surgery. Um, they can hurt. So we want to avoid spicy foods and citrus because those can aggravate. Um, and truly the education is going to be prevention of spread. That is the biggest intervention that we're going to be doing in education. No kissing with open lesions, no oral sex, 
Um, and then treatments will include things like anti-inflammatories, over-the-counter ointments, and in severe outbreaks, they can do an antiviral like acyclovir. There is a reason why we don't want people kissing babies. And this is a big reason why, because people can shed that virus onto a baby and they're they're helpless and boom, now the person's gonna have cold sores forever. Um, HSV-1 and HSV-2 are forever. So prevention is key here. The other oral disorder that we talk about is candidiasis. This is a yeast infection in the mouth. This is thrush. This, it looks like cottage cheese. The most common pathogen for this is your candida albicans. And your highest risk patients are going to be older adults, immunocompromised like HIV and cancer patients, um, people on long-term steroids, and our big one, inhaled corticosteroids. This is why we swish and spit after those corticosteroid inhalers. So you'll see there'll be like a white plaque, kind of like a cheese appearance on the tongue. We treat this with swish and swallow of nystatin. Oral health are important teaching things. New toothbrushes, we don't want to keep reinfecting. Rinse after corticosteroid inhalers. Um, candidiasis really is not painful. It's uncomfortable. It tastes weird. Um, are the like most common complaints, but you don't need any other pain medication except for the nice statin to clear it up. So caring for somebody with either of these disorders, education, we want to actively prevent infections. So one of the big things is oral care. We want to lower the bacteria in the mouth. The mouth is disgusting. But if you have a crack in your mouth, all the bacteria that's in your mouth can go into your body and cause an infection. So it can be a localized infection that turns into a systemic one. Brushing and flossing, which people tend to not do in the hospital. Chlorhexidine can also be a mouthwash. It's a prescription mouthwash that can help prevent infections, um, rinsing and spitting. And then also we want to make sure that people are eating and drinking. If you've ever had any type of injury into your mouth, like a bad tooth or, you know, you bit the inside of your cheek or anything like that, eating can be uncomfortable. So we want to make sure that they're getting enough nutrition, um, even though they have one of these disorders going on. We need calories to fight infection. Um, and then minimizing pain and discomfort. So truly with candidiasis, there's not much aside from treating it. We don't need narcotics. HSV-1, it's going to be those anti-inflammatories or topical ointments to help with that. <clears throat> Any questions on the mouth disorders? Okay. Well, let's move on down to the throat and we're going to talk about GERD. This one you guys should be pretty comfortable with because it's so common and we see it all the time. Gastroesophageal reflux is the gastric contents going back into the esophagus. So it's leaking backward. It's kind of like the clogged drain and it just kind of backflows. It can't move forward, so it's going to move backwards. The primary cause of GERD is an incompetent lower esophageal sphincter. So you have your esophagus, you have your stomach, and there's a little door between the two. When you, re when you swallow, the sphincter relaxes and it lets the food go down into the stomach. If that sphincter doesn't work properly, it will remain open a little bit and that gastric contents can kind of leak backwards because there's a hole and it's gonna find a spot to go. The lower esophageal sphincter is a high pressure area. Again, just above the stomach. The sphincter closes the lower portion of the esophagus, but relaxes after each swallow to allow that food to enter. So this is why we want people to sit upright after eating. So they don't, that acid doesn't go back and eat away at the esophagus. Other causes of GERD are things like pyloric stenosis, which are common in babies. So that sphincter at the bottom of the stomach isn't working properly and causes the acid to crawl back up. Hiatal hernias, 
Um, anything that causes excessive intra-abdominal or intragastic pressure. So anything that causes a whole bunch of stuff to build up in the stomach, gas, things like that, um, or straining. There is not vomiting or belching associated with GERD. Other conditions will have that, but not so much this. This is just truly the feeling, that burning sensation in the throat, sour taste, like we call it the bad spits, um, chest pain, which is concerning, um, <clears throat> feeling hoarse, coughing, and then my favorite, feeling food re-enter your mouth, regurgitation. That's my favorite symptom. It's like you can feel it come right back up because that lower soft, that sphincter didn't close properly. Um, so things that lower that pressure are things like alcohol, cigarettes. So we don't want them smoking or drinking if they have GERD. And then medications like anticholinergic drugs and calcium channel blockers kind of really relax things. So they put them at risk for having GERD. We also want to consider conditions that increase intra-abdominal pressure, pregnancy, obesity, excessive bending. So if you have a whole bunch of pressure going on here, like if your midsection is really big, it's gonna push things back up that sphincter. We also have to be careful because pulmonary complications can come from GERD because contents in the throat, we can aspirate. So we have to watch out for that. Um, secondary issues that we see from GERD are things like dental erosion. The acid from the stomach wears away at the enamel of the teeth. Uh, ulcers can form in the esophageal area, can damage the esophagus. And um, also, if not treated, can potentially lead to cancer. So we want to make sure that GERD symptoms are being treated. This isn't something we're just going to like, it'll be fine. We have to do something about it. So to diagnose, I'm going to do the best test in the whole wide world. Not really, but it's great. Is an EGD. Um, we don't do any of these diagnostics until we have an HMP done, a history and physical, okay? They'll report their symptoms, we do a physical assessment, and then this would be ordered. That EGD is done under conscious sedation, so they're getting Versed, Propofol, we have to watch out afterwards. Again, that scope will go down their throat and we can see the sphincter and the esophageal tissues. When they're down the throat, they're looking at the esophagus. Um, so esophagitis is going to be that inflammation. It's going to be red and icky. Barrett's esophagus is a precursor to esophageal adenocarcinoma. So that mucosal lining of the esophagus is changed. They're not, the cell structure are different. We don't have squamous epithelials anymore. We have more column lined. It looks like intestines, which it shouldn't. The lining isn't pink. It's going to be bright red. Um, and again, because the acid has changed the cellular structure, this puts them at risk for adenocarcinoma. These patients will also have the symptoms of GERD because GERD is what's causing this. So we diagnose this through a biopsy and then we continually biopsy. We do meds and potentially some surgeries. Um, the barium swallow is that upper GI series. So we have them drink that barium and they do the x-rays under fluoroscopy. So they're like live moving, it's like a flip book and they can see what's going on with the esophagus. It helps them look for things like a hiatal hernia where we have part of the stomach in a place it shouldn't be or any other type of stricture that forms that's going to cause this acid reflux to occur. Um, so you can see here in these pictures, these are the cellular structures that we don't want to see. It shouldn't look like that inside the esophagus. It should look all pretty and pink. And then here is more of esophagitis. We have some bleeding and irritation going on.
the treatment for GERD. There's a lot of meds in this unit, but guess what? They're almost all the same. The GI meds are pretty much the same things. Certain meds will be used in certain conditions and there'll be a few different ones. So to treat GERD, proton pump inhibitors. Um, these slow down um, or decrease the amount of how much acid is being produced in the stomach. So this is your protonics, your pantoprazole or your omeprazole. What do we need to know about PPIs? Don't take them. We take vitamins 12 hours apart. We want to make sure that the vitamins get absorbed. We do have a, a high risk of infection, of C. diff infection with PPIs. So something to be on the lookout for. And acid, these are your Tums. Over the counter, we've probably all taken them at some point in our, in our life to help neutralize the acid and to kind of help with alle alleviate the symptoms. Your histamine 2 receptors, these are like your famotidine, your pepsid. These will help decrease acid production. And then we have meds like metoclopramide. This is Reglin. This will help uh, get the stuff out of your stomach quicker. So accelerating gastric emptying means it's just going to move things along. Um, the longer food sits in the stomach, and the more food is present, the more acid that's going to be produced. So as soon as it gets into the stomach, if we eat big, big meals, a lot of acid is going to be produced, which will produce symptoms. That's why we want small, frequent meals. And But metoclopramide will help move things along. And then we have caraphate. That's going to help pre uh, preserve the mucosal barrier. It's like a thick, they can have a liquid or a pill. And it helps coat the stomach and, and feel a little bit better. You want to make sure that you take those apart from antacids. So this chart that was in your books is important just to help you understand how they work and what we have to do when we're giving this medication. Don't forget your pharmacology. In terms of what we need to teach our patient, diet's going to be huge with GERD. We want to avoid things like caffeine, tobacco, beer, milk, peppermint, and carbonation. All of these stimulate the production of stomach acid. Additionally, any of you guys drink like fizzy waters, bubble water, like bubbler or uh, bubbly, any of the, or soda, Sprite? The bubbles produce gas and that cause that increases intra-abdominal pressure, which will open up that sphincter, making you have acid reflux. So we want to avoid these things. Um, four to six small meals, again, decreases the amount of acid that would need to be produced. People live with this all the time at home, but we talk about lifestyle modifications that need to be made. One of them being don't lay down after eating. You want to stay upright for at least two hours. If you lay flat, it's going to cause those contents to go right back up and you can feel the ickiness. We want to sit there. Don't eat two hours before you go to bed. Um, avoiding tight fitting clothing. No super tight mom jeans, no corsets, anything like that because that increases that abdominal pressure. Weight loss is a big one. We want to minimize the, the pressure in the abdomen and losing weight can help do that. And then one of the easiest things that people can do at home is to elevate the head of their bed. How can people elevate the head of their bed at home if they don't have a hospital bed? With pillows? Uh, pillows are one way. Anything else that you can think of? Like a fancy pillow, but it's one that you like actually sit up on. Like, I can't, I don't know what it's called, but. <laughs> like a wedge pillow? Kind of, yeah. And they do make wedges that can go like underneath your mattress to kind of lift you up as well. Yep, sleeping in a recliner, which isn't always comfortable, but if you know you might have a flare, that can be helpful. When my son had it, we put stuff underneath the feet of his bed as where his head was. So he slept more on like an incline, which works and doesn't work because if you have kids you know how much they move when they sleep and sometimes it's futile and they end up at the foot of the bed but you know little things like that so we don't need a hospital bed to be upright is kind of where i'm going with this 
um, but those are all interventions. Um, GERD in and of it by itself, we can control. We can change the foods that we eat. We can take medications. We can lose weight. In the event that the GERD is so severe or causing issues, there are surgeries that can be done to help strengthen the lower esophageal sphincter. And that's something called a Nissen fund application, which we'll talk about in a little bit with hernias. But left untreated, we need to educate patients that this can cause chronic inflammation, kill and break down the cells that are in your esophagus and lead to cancer or aspiration. So definitely something we just don't wanna like neglect. Any questions about GERD? All right. I have a question. Sorry. Is, no is GERD, I remember last semester we learned about H. pylori. Is that, am I like totally they off? They are two different things. So it doesn't lead to that? H. pylori could in a sense, but H. pylori is a, a bacteria that attacks the, the, the stomach um, and causes a lot of GI symptoms. Okay. So it's not going to wear it down to where like they get. It can H cause pylori. ulcers. It's going to cause ulcers. Okay. Thank you. And we're going to get, we're going to do a little bit about H. pylori soon too. So hopefully that'll all clear up. Okay. All right. Esophageal varices. These are little, they're not little. They're fragile blood vessels that were in the esophagus but all of a sudden they got really swollen and big because of portal hypertension. So the liver is failing, it's cirrhotic, it increases the pressure of what it's giving things off for, and it causes the, the veins in the throat to get real swollen and fat. So esophageal varices are the submucosal veins getting dilated. They're real big. Um, this is the result of cirrhosis. These are usually caused by alcohol, but we can see it in all types of liver failure, but more commonly with alcoholic cirrhosis. Um, the scary things about esophageal varices is we really don't have signs and symptoms until one ruptures. And they rupture very, very easily because that skin is very delicate. So if they do rupture, your patient is going to be vomiting bright red blood, hematoemesis, and they're going to have dark, tarry stools, bloody, dark, tarry stools, melanin. So as blood travels through the GI tract, it gets darker and darker. Um, low blood pressure, high heart rate. Patients can die from these rupturing. This is why we don't put NG tubes in these patients at the bedside. That little plastic tube can puncture one of these little things and then we have blood everywhere. Um, so this, again, these are your esophageal varices, real fat, fluffy looking veins. Um, to treat these, they give medications, one of them being octreotide. Octreotide is going to lower the pressure in the liver and the GI tract. Protonics will decrease the amount of acid in your stomach. Um, and then we can do, we'll do an EGD to either band or clip or coil um, when bleeding is occurring. And here is an example of one bleeding and they bleed a lot but people will be choking on blood, high risk of aspiration, um, definitely something that we want to avoid. It is a safe bet if somebody has liver failure, especially significant liver failure or like they're really like yellow, it's a safe bet that they have esophageal varices. Um, and this is an example of a banding trying to stop the blood. So it's gonna kind of pinch it off and pinch it off and pinch it off and then it'll just kind of like fall and do its own thing. I have a question. 
Um, why, why would this cause a low blood pressure and a high heart rate? Because we're losing blood. So if they're okay. talking, if it ruptures, that's what they're, you're going to have signs of hypovolemia because we're massively. Losing. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Good question. Um, any other questions about the varices? This is a medical emergency. This is very, very scary when these rupture. There's a lot of blood and a lot of panic. Because nobody wants blood coming out of their mouth. All right. So hiatal hernias. So a hiatal hernia happens when your part of your stomach decides that it's going to move into a spot that it shouldn't be. So your diaphragm keeps your organs that are supposed to be below it, below it. With a hiatal hernia, it's pushed its way through up above the diaphragm. So you got part of your stomach that's above this. Um, this is common with age. It's also common with things like esophageal cancer or trauma. Obesity and smoking are common risk factors for a hiatal hernia. This is a little bit different than another, like um, an inguinal hernia, because this is more, this is your stomach. Um, patients that have hiatal hernias will have heartburn, chest pain, dysphagia, so difficulty swallowing or painful swallowing, and then belching. So with GERD, we don't typically have the burping, but with hiatal hernias, we do. So to diagnose this, upper GI series or an EGD and a CT scan of the chest, they can see that the stomach is, part of it is not where it should be. Patients with a hiatal hernia, again, will, might have issues with swallowing, um, but typically we, we start on meds. The meds that we start, we treat a hiatal hernia with are PPIs or antacids. We can take meds and people can learn to live with this. In the event that it's not working or causing a lot of issues, they can do that missing fund application. So what they do is they take the fundus, which is the top of the stomach, and they wrap it around that lower esophageal sphincter to tighten it. So that way it will open and close the way that it's supposed to. So it's gonna kind of reinforce the area around it because it was too loose being above the diaphragm. After surgery, if they do this, avoid lifting. They'll typically wear an abdominal binder to help keep things in place. And then their diet is gonna change. Low fat diets, um, frequent bland meals. And then the same thing, don't lay down for two hours after eating, keep the head of the bed at least 15 degrees, um, lose weight, that sort of thing. Um, we start on a soft diet after surgery, uh, splinting. If they need to move or cough, we put a pillow in front of their abdomen, have them hold that to kind of push back in, um, and not straining. So we want to prevent constipation. All right, let's go ahead and do a poll question here. Select all that apply because they're your favorites.
Okay. 70% answer. I'll take it. So which patient is most likely to experience GERD? An obese patient with a hiatal hernia? Absolutely. A, they're obese, B, they have a hiatal hernia. That's two risk factors. So yes. A smoker with a history of COPD? Yes. It says a smoker, which means they are still smoking. And smoking is a risk factor for GERD. Osteoporosis? No. Um, 45-year-old alcoholic? Yes. Alcohol will cause GERD. And then a middle-aged adult with a functioning lower esophageal sphincter? No. Functioning means it's working, which means they would not be at risk for it. We want it functioning. All righty. Questions on any of those first diseases? All right, we'll do one more before break. So gastritis is where we're getting to next. So gastritis can either be acute or chronic. It can be erosive or non-erosive. But gastritis in and of itself is inflammation of the stomach. The mucosa that surrounds it gets mad, it gets triggered for any number of reasons. So non-erosive gastritis is caused by H. pylori. H. pylori causes ulcers, peptic ulcer disease. So symptoms of H. pylori are going to be things like upper abdominal pain, feeling full after only eating a little bit, bloating, loss of appetite, dark stools because we're bleeding from the ulcers. H. pylori is common in, in children and primarily in areas with poor sanitation. And this is also spread by contact because people don't wash their hands. <clears throat> um, erosive gastritis is caused kind of by something we did. NSAIDs, ibuprofen, alcohol, or radiation. So something intense caused inflammation in that stomach lining. These patients have an increased risk of developing stomach cancer, more so than the other kinds. Acute gastritis comes on quick. It is usually caused by ingesting either a really strong acid or a really strong base. So some kind of household cleaner or bleach will cause acute gastritis. These, that usually results in bleeding if the ingestion is really severe. And then chronic gastritis is related to some form of autoimmune disease or really tricky H. pylori that's just not going away. So for assessment for gastritis, we're going to look at their family history. Peptic ulcer disease can be a genetic thing. Um, what's going on within their family? What other conditions do they have? What medications are they on? We know NSAIDs are harsh on the stomach, and that's a big reason why your patient might be feeling pretty crummy. Smoking, caffeine, being immunocompromised, all are risk factors for having gastritis. Um, acute gastritis are going to have things like loss of appetite, hiccups, dark, tarry stools, or bleeding, um, nausea, vomiting. Chronic gastritis, belching, not tolerating things, sour taste in the mouth. But chronic gastritis will feel better after they eat something. Acute gastritis, the pain will get worse if they eat. Um, and then with the erosive gastritis, we're going to see more of the hematoemesis and the melena. So each one kind of has their own different symptoms associated with it, and some are going to be similar no matter what, like the dyspepsia or the headache. So to diagnose gastritis, we're going to look at labs. We're going to look at our blood count, CBC. Am I bleeding? Um, is there an infection present? What's going on? H. pylori. How do we test for H. pylori? By 
everybody does know. either a breath test or the stool test yep remember the breath test we breathe into a control bag we drink a drink we blow into the other bag and then it'll kind of tell us if we're positive or negative for h pylori test um, other diagnostics, a good old EGD with a biopsy, grab some of that stomach tissue, see what's going on. Is there an infection present? Is there erosion? What's going on here? We want to also make sure that when we're caring for somebody with gastritis, we're watching for bleeding. These patients are at high risk of developing an upper GI bleed. So they'd be vomiting blood or having that melana, the dark tart stools. Um, and then education and medications. So what medications are we going to be given? A whole lot of the same ones we gave for GERD, PPIs and acids, mucosal barriers. Antibiotics are new. If it is caused by H. pylori, we treat H. pylori with a two week course of antibiotics. So what education would you want to provide? Think about that. And then a new med that we would give for gastritis is misoprostol. So misoprostol will help um, not only um, secrete gastric acid, so it decreases the amount of gastric acid, but it helps protect that stomach mucosal. Misoprostol, though, is also a medication that will dilate a cervix and cause a miscarriage. So if somebody, let's say they are unfortunately suffering from a miscarriage, misoprostol will help soften the cervix and help pass the products of conception easier. So if somebody needs this medication for gastritis, we want them on contraception. Um, and if they're pregnant, we would avoid this medication. <clears throat> um, other education for gastritis, Let's avoid the triggers, no drinking, no caffeine. Um, and we also want to watch stress levels. You guys have probably heard jokes that like, yeah, your job is gonna give you an ulcer or you're so stressed out, you're gonna give yourself an ulcer. That is a very real thing. So do your patients have effective coping mechanisms, which usually we don't, we're human. We do things we're not supposed to. We have that extra glass of wine, we don't sleep, we worry we have to find ways to reduce the stress in our life. Preaching to the choir, I know. Um, and then also making sure that we're educating them on the medications that they're on. The big, bad, scary things that can happen with gastritis, again, that GI bleed. We want to watch for anything coming out of their mouth or their rectum that shouldn't be. Um, a big complication of gastritis is pernicious anemia. So in pernicious anemia, the stomach no longer secretes the intrinsic factor that is needed for vitamin B12 absorption. So pernicious anemia is a lack of vitamin B12. Gastritis damages that stomach mucosa, which interferes with the body's ability to produce that intrinsic factor. So these patients typically will have to be on lifelong IM injections of B12 because they can't absorb B12 any other way anymore because of the damage that's been done. Common symptoms of pernicious anemia are pale skin, pale mucous membranes, feeling weak, tired, bleh, loss of appetite. And then the big giveaway is glossitis. So glossitis is like a swollen, inflamed, like cracked tongue. That is a dead giveaway that they have vitamin B12 deficiency. All right, let's go ahead and do another poll question.
All right. 100% of the people that answered got it correct. Woohoo. So it's damaging that stomach mucosa that interferes with the um, production of the intrinsic factor. All right. <clears throat> It's a good place to take a break before we get to peptic ulcer disease. So we are at 1049. Let's pop back at 11. Because it's Friday. <laughs> Great and wins. 
simmer down, you're fine. All right, let's bring it on back here. And we'll jump on to our next disease. Turn the cameras on. Yeah. Okay, some people are back. All right, I'm gonna keep moving. So peptic ulcer disease is our next disease. And that is, in simplest terms, erosion that has happened. So either the stomach, esophagus, or the duodenum, or even the jejunum, it has worn away and it can lead to peritonitis. So an ulcer will start to kind of rip away at that mucosal lining. And then if it perforates, then we have contents leading into leaking into the peritoneum. So peptic ulcer disease is very common. Most ulcers are duodenum, duodenal, but again, they can occur in the lower esophagus, the stomach. Um, the two major causes are H. pylori infection, nasty little bug, and NSAID use. Other things that can cause ulcers though are untreated GERD. That acid ripping away at the esophagus, it is not meant to be there. It can wear it down and wear it away. Um, stress, a family history, and some other diseases like COPD, kidney issues, or excessive drinking. Alcohol is in, in excess is not great for the body. It rips away, it destroys things, and that's what happens with peptic ulcer disease. Um, <clears throat> so when we are concerned about, uh, I'm sorry, symptoms of an ulcer, a lot of it has to do with what they're telling you, their, like, their background, their family history, what they are all about, but they're going to have dyspepsia. That's that big symptom. So that sour taste, that icky taste in their mouth. Also some mid-epigastric pain or back pain, um, and then hematoemesis or melanoma, which is going to be bloody vomit in black tarry stools. Um, so to diagnose a peptic ulcer, we do H. pylori because it's such a big cause of the ulcers. We're also going to check an H and H. We're checking for hemorrhage. So that's your hemoglobin and hematocrit. That will tell us if there's bleeding going on. Um, your PT is going to tell us about your clotting factors. And then your fecal occult blood test. We are looking for blood. So with somebody with an active ulcer, that could be positive. Additionally, we can do that EGD, that scope, take a look and see what's going on um, and see if any ulcers are present. This is a painful condition. Um, <clears throat> so caring for them and things that you're going to do, watch those vital signs. We want to see if we're having any orthostatic changes. If they're bleeding, we can see drops in pressure when they change positions, watching their labs. Their meds should look really familiar. PPIs, antacids, H2s, these are all the same. The only difference are gonna be your antibiotics if it's um, that we're being added to this. So with gastric ulcers, we tend to have more weight loss, vomiting, and pain when they eat. With duodenal ulcers, they, they appear fine. They're not losing weight, normal body, but they're going to start developing pain two to three hours after they eat, and food may decrease their pain. Um, if it's more of a stress ulcer, usually that's due to some kind of physiological condition like burns or things like that, but also their own, their own internal stress. Smoking increases the risks of developing an ulcer along with alcohol. So. Patients that have ulcers should not drink or smoke. So how do we treat them? Well, first and foremost, we do meds. We do the PPIs. We do the diet changes. We make those lifestyle modifications. If nothing works in terms of medications or the changes that they made, 
after 12 to 16 weeks, then they can do surgery. So we have to try conservative measures first for three to four months, then they can do surgery. Unless they have a, um, a perforation where they're actively bleeding, then they would do surgery beforehand. But if they're not actively bleeding, we're gonna treat with meds. So the surgery that they can do, there's a couple different ones. One being a gastrectomy, where they're basically going to remove a large portion of the stomach. It's gonna remove that lower, that lower portion, about half of the stomach. Um, the part that they're removing is going to remove the hormonal stimulus of the parietals, parietal cells. Um, they can also kind of do a bypass, potentially, when they're going to remove um, remove part of the stomach and reconnect things. Or they can do something like a vagotomy, where they're going to cut the vagus nerve to decrease gastric acid production. Or a pyloplasty, where they're going to enlarge the pyloric sphincter, which is at the bottom of the stomach, to help get things out of the stomach more quickly. A lot of different things that they can do for ulcers. Again, first and foremost, we want to treat with medications, diet, and exercise. If they do have surgery, guys, no matter what kind of surgery people have, the post-op care is generally the same. If it's their stomach, if it's their head, if it's their foot, we want to prevent infection. We want to prevent blood clots. So keep that, it, there's no magic wand to say like everybody has different things. They'll have stuff catered to that area, but for the most part, prevent infection, prevent bleeding, prevent those big bad complications from happening. So if they have a gastric um, surgery, watch for signs and symptoms of infection. Look at the incision. We don't want any abnormal color drainage, any fevers, any vomiting. Um, we do the dressing changes as they're ordered. We exercise them as they're tolerated. SCDs, we prevent blood clots. We use our incentive spirometer to keep them, their lungs exercised. Um, with having a gastrectomy, they'll have an NG tube. That NG tube will probably be have real bloody content for about a day or two. We do not do anything with the NG tube unless specifically ordered by the surgeon. Not the resident, not the other attending, the surgeon is the only one who can say, irrigate this or do this with this. We typically leave it alone. Um, like with any surgery, we want to monitor our bowel sounds. Remember, surgeries decrease peristalsis, and we get very excited when our patient starts farting again. That means things are starting to move along. So gas is a great sign. You'll never be so excited for a fart in your life, I swear. Um, <clears throat> once that starts resuming, we can start increasing their diet as they're able to, based off of the recommendations of the surgeon. They might be very small portions. Um, they might have different caloric needs, but watch those bowel sounds. Um, and again, don't touch the NG tube unless ordered by the surgeon. So the big bad scaries, hemorrhage. If the ulcer perforates and we're bleeding everywhere, bleeding internally, um, this is a emergency surgery type of situation. IV fluids, uh, pain management, but we have to treat it as an emergency. Hemor hemorrhage or perforation can quickly cause hypovolemic shock. Another complication is pernicious anemia. Why? Because that ulcer is eating away at that intrinsic factor production. So it's not going to happen. We're not absorbing B12. So another disorder that can cause pernicious anemia. Dumping syndrome is another complication that can happen after surgery. Um, and it happens after they eat. So after they eat, all of a sudden they get real bloated, real nauseous, and then they are pooping and everything everywhere. This has to do with the osmotic shift. So fluid getting pulled into places and it's just like, I have nowhere to go and I'm going out. 
So <clears throat> it causes uh, rapid gastric em emptying. Um, if there is an obstruction of that pyloric sphincter, they can place an NG tube to help facilitate with that as well, probably um, to keep that open. Um, so gastritis that we talked about before break um, can result in peptic ulcer disease. Both gastritis and peptic ulcer disease can cause pernicious anemia. The education that we have to put forth to the patient is changing the foods. So these are similar dietary changes to um, some of the other things that the, the GERD and the, um, no coffee, no carbonation, no alcohol minimize spicy foods. The difference with peptic ulcer disease is we want to avoid extremes in temperatures. And I'm not talking about like the desert in Antarctica, the temperatures in the food. Cold foods can cause hurt and hot can cause bleeding. So we want kind of room temperature in terms of food. No NSAIDs, monitor for bleeding. If we're smoking, we need to stop stress mechanisms, and then taking their medications. <clears throat> Diet changes here are key. We want to restrict acid producing foods, which are more like your milk, your caffeine, and the spicy foods. Um, if they're on antibiotics, we take the whole course, all that education that goes along with it. Yes, you're gonna feel better, don't stop. If you start peeing out of your butt, let us know, you know, that sort of thing. Um, what is bismuth salicylate? Pepto? Pepto bismol. This is a med that we would want peptic ulcer patients not to take because there's aspirin in it and we, we want to monitor for bleeding. So we're going to avoid aspirin. So Pepto might feel good, but that aspirin in there can actually work against them. So we'd want to switch it to a different type of medication to help with the relief. Okay. I have a question. I feel like sometimes I hear that people drink milk when they feel like acid reflux type of stuff. Like that kind of, is that like they should totally avoid? They really, we, we don't want them to only because it increases acid production. So it might offer temporary relief, but okay. it's going to stimulate more acid to be produced. And people typically like milk when they eat spicy food because it helps neutralize, you know, in mm. a sense, but it's going to help, it's going to increase that acid. So it really does not work for us as much as we want it to. Okay. So some people might think it does, but in reality, it's really not good. I could make it worse. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I watch to see how the percentage of answers change before I move on. So I'm sitting there staring at you, that's why. So what is appropriate for patient? When is it appropriate for a patient with PUD? 
to undergo surgery, and that is going to be there is a life threatening hemorrhage of the stomach. Um, before perforation occurs, and yes, that's true, but the hemorrhage is the better answer here. Um, and it may never perforate, which then we wouldn't need surgery for. Um, one week, we need 12 to 16 weeks of meds before we're going to jump there. Um, and only when a vasotomy is recommended, not the best answer choice. All right. So to compare these, just this chart is here. This is a really good chart to help compare everything. The diet changes, the meds, and then the symptoms. So if you are a highlighter or a printer or a rewriter, this one is probably your best bet. Um, you can see there are sim symptoms that are common in all four. Dysphagia, or uh, dysphagia is in the first two. Dyspepsia is in the last two. So there's symptoms for each. Um, the one thing you have in common in PPIs and antacids are gonna be used to treat all four. And for the most part, it's like one or two different meds. The dietary restrictions are going to be probably the most difficult because a lot of them are similar, but then there are some differences. So to be nice, I'll do our next polling question with this chart left up to help you answer. All righty, so what do we need to, what, which ones do we avoid caffeine in? And that is going to be, let's take a look at our chart. GERD, gastritis, and peptic ulcer disease. So B, C, and D. Hiatal hernia, we don't have to avoid caffeine. Um, <clears throat> and esophageal varices, we have no dietary restrictions for. Sorry, I didn't share, my bad. All right. So questions on any of those diseases? So next portion is gonna be our non-inflammatory bowel disorders. And most of these you guys are probably pretty comfortable with. So hopefully this isn't, uh, too new to you guys, and I don't bore you too much. So first and foremost, let's talk about diarrhea. Diarrhea is more than three bowel movements a day with increased liquidity, meaning it's water coming out of your rectum. Remember your Bristol stool form chart, type one, your hard, hard pebbles that are difficult to pass. Stage two is gonna be formed, lumpy, but difficult. We want four. Four is our happy place. Um, and then anything past four is going to be leaning more towards diarrhea, but six and seven are hardcore diarrhea. Um, 
So the causes of diarrhea, viruses, we've all been sick. We have all had diarrhea in our lives at some point, usually because of illness. Medications, one of the main side effects of medications, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Drugs in general, illicit drugs can cause diarrhea or if you're withdrawing. Um, certain diseases, we see this. And then things that we eat, like Taco Bell. Sometimes your stomach just does not like it and it causes an increase and get out. Diarrhea in and of, of itself isn't something we care, uh, not, that's not the way I want to word this. We have to watch for things like dehydration. That's our big, bad, scary thing with dehydrate, with diarrhea, because you're, you're getting rid of a lot of water with your stool, so your electrolytes will be off. So we're looking for any signs and symptoms of an issue with our electrolytes. We want to make sure that they stay hydrated. If you've ever, well, you guys have all had diarrhea. One of the, the scariest things to do is to eat when you don't feel good because you don't want it to come back out. So these patients are at risk for some nutritional deficiencies depending on how long it's lasting. The other complication of diarrhea is really the skin integrity. Diarrhea is very acidic and hard on the skin. Keep in mind too, you know, the frequent cleansing of the toilet paper with the stool can be very irritating to the skin. It can start to hurt and chafe. Um, <clears throat> Flushable wipes are not flushable, but anything soft and kind of with a little bit of moisture can be more helpful to the skin and more cleansing. But no matter what it says, or no matter what's on the label, don't flush it. I promise you, you will regret it. Um, so treatment for diarrhea, we have to figure out the cause. So anytime your patient is having diarrhea, all of a sudden, we're gonna test for C. diff. If it is C. diff, we treat with antibiotics and some fluids to keep them hydrated. But we don't give them any of the other anti-diarrheal medications, we just treat with antibiotics. If the C. diff is negative and they're having this diarrhea, then we can use some other medications. So loperamide, Imodium, is an over-the-counter anti-diarrheal medication. You take two pills at the onset, your next liquid stool, you take another one up until so many capsules a day. It helps bind everything back up and not be loose. Diphenoxylate with atropine, lamotil, is a prescription anti-diarrheal that can be used sometimes with some of our cancer patients, truly depends, but it helps, again, form our stool back together. And then making sure that they are staying hydrated. So if you're at home, any way to keep your electrolytes in, Pedialyte, sugar-free Gatorade, pickle juice, but if you're in the hospital, IV fluids are going to be helpful with this as well. Feel good about diarrhea? As good as you can feel about it, right? All right. Incontinence, fecal incontinence. This is when stool is passing out and you don't mean it to for more than three months. So this is more than just an accident here or there. This is going on for an extended period of time. Causes of fecal incontinence are going to be things um, like nerve damage, maybe due to hyper, uh, diabetes, a spinal cord injury, childbirth, thanks kids, any type of back injury or surgery, any type of anal trauma that may decrease that ability to hold you know, open up and, and go. Um, <clears throat> any type of sphincter weakness. This is common in adults over 65, but it is not expected, okay? We're not gonna say, oh yeah, you're 70, it's totally fine, you're pooping your pants. No, we have to find what the cause is and then try to make some adjustments. There aren't really any complications physically with fecal incontinence, except for maybe some impaired skin integrity issues. But the big one is going to be a decreased quality of life. Because for the most part, most people don't want to be having accidents. And they're fully aware that they're happening, but they can't do anything about it. 
their their sphincter is just like, yeah, here you go. I, I, I can't hold it anymore. Or the body doesn't, the, there's not a message getting computed to the brain. Um, <clears throat> you know, and most people don't want to be wearing some kind of brief to control the stool. So we want to treat the cause, whatever the cause may be, if we are able to. And then if we are not, we can pre-medicate patients with antidiarrheal medications before they eat, so the stool will be more firm and not leaky, um, and then maintaining their skin integrity. So again, this has to go on for more than three months, um, and usually there's some other thing that we see associated with this. Um, on the flip side, we have constipation. And this is going to be less than three bowel movements a week. And then on the Bristol chart, your ones or your twos. So everybody's got their patterns. Maybe you're an every other day person. Maybe you're an every day, 6 a.m., I wake up like clockwork. Everybody has their own thing. But less than three, hard rocks, lumpy, lumpy dry stool, that qualifies as constipation. Constipation can become an issue because of what it does to the body. So if you are constantly straining, trying to push it out, you can pass out. That's that vasovagal syncope. When you vasovagal, you increase your intrathoracic pressure in your abdominal cavity, which collapses the veins, which decreases the blood flow, which makes you fall down and go boom. So we don't want that to happen. You should not have to strain to go to the bathroom. Also, if you are straining and straining and straining repeatedly, that can lead to hemorrhoids, which is another complication. Um, megacolon and toxic megacolon happen with dilation of the intestines. Because they are so full of stool, they, they get poofy and inflamed and can get infected. So we want to prevent this from happening. We want to go to the bathroom and prevent constipation from happening. The key to preventing constipation is our diet. High fiber foods. What are some examples of high fiber foods? Oatmeal, brown rice. Is that what it is? Brown rice or like wheat rice? I don't even know what the other, not white rice. Right, brown rice over white. Potatoes. Same thing with bread. Wheat bread over yeah, white wheat bread. bread. Potatoes, like fruits and veggies. Mm -hmm. So diet is diet is really important with GI stuff. What would you recommend people to eat? So if we want high fiber, fruits, veggies, beans, legumes, whole grains, bran, we want to decrease our processed foods um, decrease dairy and decrease our meat. Meat portions are huge, especially in this country, and they're supposed to be a lot smaller than what they are, but meat can be constipating. We also want to make sure they are drinking plenty of appropriate fluids, like two to three liters a day of water. Patients will say, okay, I've been, I had a 12 pack of beer last night. I got my fluids. That's not the fluid we're talking about. And that has actually happened to me. So we have to be specific. Um, other ways to prevent constipation is staying active. By moving, we are promoting peristalsis, which is the movement of the intestines to move things along. So high fiber diet, fluids, exercise. And then the big one, which adults usually don't have as much problem with, but kids do, is go actually going to the bathroom when you feel like you have to go. Kids don't want to be interrupted with what they're doing. Like they're very involved in their activities. They will hold on to that stool because they don't want to stop. Whereas grownups are going to be like, no, I'm going to go take a poop. And that's what we need to do. Everybody poops. It's a natural thing. But some people do have issues going to the bathroom in public. And if they hold it and hold it, it can lead to constipation. Um, <clears throat> other treatments for constipation are the medications. Um, you should definitely be familiar with what all these medications do, okay? So something like psyllium, Metamucil, will, it's a fiber supplement, so we want to take with water. It's to help stimulate peristalsis. 
milk of magnesia. Okay, it's an icky, gross liquid to stimulate peristalsis and to help move things along. Mineral oil helps lubricate the stool and make it a little bit easier to pass. Our, our, um, our laxatives, our senna, our dulcolax will um, help move things along. It's a stimulant. It kickstarts things. It makes the colon mad, makes it move, and helps get it out. Our colase, our docusate, is a stool softener. So it's not going to have a laxative effect, but it's going to hydrate the stool and make it easier to pass, make it a little slimy. And then our polyethylene glycol or our go lightly, this is going to help cleanse the colon and push it through. Um, all very common medications that you will see. Some patients are on something like Senna every single day. Our narcotic patients typically are on Senna with their meds um, or at the very least a colase, depending on what's going on. If we start having diarrhea and they're on one of these meds, then we're gonna hold back and kind of restart. Um, Questions on constipation? Hemorrhoids. So we talked about varicose veins. When did we talk about those? In one of our cardiac units? You know, we get those in the legs. We can get those in our butt too. So hemorrhoids are varicose veins in your anal canal. They can either be inside or they can be external. They can come outside. The primary cause of hemorrhoids is going to be straining, either from bowel movements or having a baby. It is very common after pregnancy to have hemorrhoids because of the pushing and it's just like its way out. Um, so hemorrhoids itch. There is some pain associated with them. The big symptom is bright red streaking of blood on a piece of stool. So it just like coats the top of it as it comes out the anus. You'll just see the little the little streak of blood. Um, other causes of hemorrhoids, being obese or pregnant, heavy lifting, um, and not having enough fiber in your diet. We don't do fecal occult blood tests with hemorrhoid patients because they're going to come back positive. So we'd need, if we are concerned about a GI bleed, we need other testing. Um, to prevent hemorrhoids, High fiber foods prevent constipation, staying hydrated, not sitting for long periods of time. And then if they do have them, we want to educate the patient, hey, keep your area clean. Okay. We don't want any infection to happen because we know that the butt is a dirty place. So making sure that they're cleansing appropriately, not straining when they're defecating, and that high fiber diet. People live with hemorrhoids, no problem. There's ointments that they can use to help with the pain or, or the itching. In some cases, they can actually uh, do surgery where they can remove the hemorrhoids, which is not overly pleasant either. So it depends on how many are present and how it's interfering with someone's life. All righty. And then a hernia. And a hernia. Not to be confused with the hiatal, but this is going to be tissue that pops through a weakness in the abdominal cavity. So we can have epigastric hernias that will happen like right in the epigastro, umbilical around the belly button, inguinal is more in our groin, but basically they're pushing through a weak spot in the muscle or tissue. Um, Risk factors for developing a hernia are going to be things like being a male, increasing age. So the older men are at the highest risk for developing one of these types of hernias and anything that increases the intra-abdominal pressure. So what you see is a lump or a big bump where there is not supposed to be. Sometimes they're itty bitty and sometimes they are big like tennis ball sized. So typically what we want to do is kind of, well, we don't, but they'll push it back into place, like get back out of here. 
and then they'll use some type of belt to kind of push it. If they are worried about blood flow, or maybe it's going to cause a bowel obstruction um, because it could be parts of the bowel that are trying to leak out and then it can get pinched off, they can do surgery. And what they do is they take some mesh and they reinforce that tissue or muscle so it can't get back out. Kind of acts like a little cage, like, haha, you're not going anywhere. If they do surgery, we want to avoid any increase in pressure for two to three weeks. So no constipation, no gassy foods, um, no tight clothing to help with that. Um, but depending on where the hernia is located, pain would be localized in that area or an aching. Um, a sense of feeling full um, can occur, something we want to look out for. People who lift things a lot are at high risk for hernias. Movers with improper lifting techniques are at high risk for these. All right. Poll question time. All right, so over-the-counter medication for constipation, and that is going to be a laxative. Yes, loperamide is over-the-counter, but loperamide is used for diarrhea, not for constipation, uh, and vanco is an antibiotic that would not be used for either one of those. All right. Irritable bowel syndrome. <clears throat> so irritable bowel syndrome is one of those diagnoses that comes over time. Um, but basically what it is, is changes in how your bowels function over a significant amount of time. The pathophysiology behind IBS is not clearly understood. I don't have an answer for you. They think it's a brain gut disorder. Um, it could be environmental factors, plus your body's factors, plus stress that causes it. But basically what happens is that your body is not going to the bathroom the way that it should, and it's causing pain over periods of time. So this isn't just like, yeah, I was constipated for three days, I have irritable bowel syndrome. It is chronic constipation, chronic diarrhea, or a combination. Um, so IBS can either be IBS diarrhea, IBS constipation, it can be a combo. Um, either way, this is something that goes over periods of time. Women are more likely to suffer from IBS than men. Um, we also see things like fatty diets leading to irritable bowel syndrome and then excessive drinking or caffeine intake. So women nurses, I feel like are high risk for IBS because a uh, lot of stress, scrappy food and, uh, you know, we survive on monsters or Red Bulls. So yes, I one hundred percent. So with IBS, really the symptoms are going to be related to what kind they have. So with diarrhea, what kind of things do we have with diarrhea? Hyperactive bowel sounds, um, some maybe some mucoidal stools, discomfort, but abdominal pain. Constipation, you're going to have more hypoactive bowel sounds, probably some cramping associated with that. 
nausea because you're not emptying out your guts, you're not really wanting to eat. So your symptoms are going to be related to what kind of issue you're having. Now, you again can have multiple issues, like maybe you're constipated for two weeks and then you have diarrhea for two weeks and it's back and forth. But with IBS to diagnose, careful history needs to be taken and we have to rule out all other GI disorders before we can get to this diagnosis. There's not like a magic test that's like, yes, you have irritable bowel syndrome. Um, it's, it is, it's a fairly common disorder. And again, we truly don't understand what happens with it. But to diagnose it after history and we've ruled out other things, they have to have certain criteria. They're having abdominal pain more than three days a month. Also, they're either going to get relief after going to the bathroom or they're going to have pain when things change from one consistency to another or how often they're going. So a lot of different criteria that they have to hit with this. Truly, because we don't necessarily know what causes it, we want to treat or prevent one of the two things from happening. So if they're having diarrhea, we want to treat the diarrhea as best we can. Anti-diarrheal medications, um, plenty of fluids, fiber in our diet. With constipation, um, laxatives, fiber, um, and avoiding anything that may cause one of these conditions to occur. We all know what triggers us, right, in terms of food. Like, that food just does not agree with me. I'm going to avoid it. Cream cheese. I can't do cream cheese or sour cream, but so I would avoid that if that was my thing. Um, things like fructose or sorbitol, those fake sugars can also be really hard on the gut, so not everybody can tolerate them. These patients are very rarely hospitalized, so patient education is going to be extremely important. What's important to understand too is that IBS patients are have a higher risk or like number they're more likely to develop diverticulitis or colon cancer so we want to prevent flares and treat the constipation and diarrhea as best we can um so avoiding the icky foods avoiding the alcohol and staying hydrated Let's talk about bowel obstructions, shall we? So bowel obstructions can either be the small or the large. Um, small bowel obstructions will result if we did an ABG, metabolic alkalosis. But basically somewhere in that small intest intestine, we either have a blockage going on or maybe a hernia pushing down and preventing things from getting through. So that's mechanical versus non-mechanical. With small bowel obstructions, your dead giveaway is the vomiting of fecal matter. Yes, they will be vomiting stool because it can't go anywhere and it needs to find its way back out. So if it can't go forward, you're going to create a buildup and then it gets to the stomach and they're like, no, thank you, but, and throw up. Um, so if your patient is puking up stool, you have a small bowel obstruction. Large bowel obstructions will typically have more of a diarrhea or ribbon-like stools. So you know the ribbon that you, the thin ribbon you take for Christmas and you take your scissors and you curl it? The stool's going to look like that because it's trying to work its way out underneath whatever is blocking it. Usually it's an impaction of stool, but it could be an organ. It could be a buildup of gook over time. You know, maybe you're a hair chewer you chew your hair, it can build up and lead to an obstruction. Um, but both large and small bowel obstructions will have obstipation, which just means trouble pooping. They'll be distended. And then we typically have borborigini, really active bowel sounds before the obstruction, and then hypo after, because there's not a whole lot going on past whatever's blocking it. The higher the obstruction, so I mean 
closer to the stomach, the more early and severe the vomiting is going to be. So if it's like, I don't know, a foot into the small bowel versus at the bottom of the small bowel, they're gonna start puking a lot more and a lot more frequent. Um, so we can't diagnose a small bowel, bowel obstruction or a large one based off of symptoms alone, but we will see changes in their labs. Their H and H, their hemoglobin and hematocrit is going to increase because they're dehydrated the less fluid to dilute the blood. So we'll see an increase in those numbers. Our BUN and creatinine, our kidney function is going to go up because it's hard on the kidneys. Um, imaging wise, if we are concerned about a bowel obstruction is we're gonna do a KUB. That is an abdominal X-ray. Again, it stands for kidney, ureter, and bladder. We can also do a CT scan, X-rays are quicker. You guys are not radiologists, but do you have any idea what is going on here? It looks like hard little stools everywhere. Yep, this person is FOS. They are full of stool. You can see all these little black bubbles, that's their, that's their large intestine full of stool. They are constipated. Why are they constipated? Because there is a big old blockage right down here, preventing it from getting out. That is an impaction. Do you know how we remove said impaction? Digital stimulation, they're gonna dig it out. And by they, I mean the resident you hate the worst. <laughs> because yes, I had a patient do that or asked me to do it as well. She was like 97 years old. No, yeah, it was terrible. <laughs> so spinal cord injury patients, this is not uncommon with. My, my, I had a friend who worked on spinal cord. She called this her money maker. They would do digital stimulation to help trigger the sphincter to actually fire and remove the stool. When it's impacted, they actually kind of have to like dig it out. Um, and unless you work on a spinal cord unit, this isn't really something you would do too often. And that would definitely be something for the residents to do. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, nothing's gonna get past that until we remove it. Um, other things that we're going to do for a bowel obstruction is going to be an NG tube with our Salem sump, the one with the blue pigtail. This will help decompress and pull out the obstruction. The goal is to use, just to have the NG tube, intermittent suction, continually pull and break away at that little obstruction. In, case, in some cases though, it might not be enough and they have to go to surgery to get the obstruction removed. Um, if it is a twisted um, intestine, a large intestine can get twisted, it's called a volvulus. They can take a colonoscopy camera shove it up there and kind of untwist it, depending on what kind of obstruction it is. Um, depending on what happens with the uh, obstruction too, excuse me, they might need a colostomy, either temporary or permanent, if we either damage that colon part too much or it dies, lack of blood flow, any number of reasons. But typically our NG tube, that's gonna be our gold standard. So remembering how to put that NG tube in, we will see stool contents coming out in that canister, okay? So things like green, yellow, brown is not uncommon. That's poop. Think about the colors of poop and that's gonna come out that too. Um, these are the patients that if you're putting in to help pull out that obstruction, you really wanna get it connected very quickly because as soon as you put that NG tube in and like you, your stool's gonna go everywhere. So yeah, fun stuff. Uh, where's my mouse? There we go. So <clears throat> if they need surgery, we want to make sure that they are NPO until we have peristalsis. So are they passing gas? Are things moving again? Um, and G tubes to help with the removal of this. Assess those bowel sounds. 
Um, these patients, again, are, are MPO. They're going to get IV fluids. They don't want to eat. They're not feeling good, but it's also not uncommon for them to be on like normal saline with 20 of K. They need potassium electrolytes to help off. Um, we do want them moving. Moving increases peristalsis and we want things to return as much as possible. Um, watch your nose, watch your mouth. We wanna make sure we're not getting any skin issues. Record those eyes and nose, including the amount and the color. Also, they have an NG tube. We want to keep them in a Fowler's position to decrease respiratory distress. If your abdomen is very distended and you lay down flat, it makes it difficult to breathe. So we want them more on an incline so they can breathe easier. All right, another poll here. It just disappeared on me. Uh oh. There we go. All righty. One key word in the, or key phrase in here should dictate what this is going to be. And that is going to be projectile vomiting of fecal matter. And that is a small bowel obstruction. All right. So before we get into inflammatory bowel disorders, we're going to go ahead and take our second break. So we are at what time? Um, 11.53.03. Let's come back at 12.05.
Okay, let's finish up here, shall we? Do, 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 do. Get my screen up and moving again. All right, so the big chunk of things that we're going to talk about next are the inflammatory bowel disorders or diseases. So, um, <clears throat> so we break these down into acute and chronic. Acute are going to be things like your appendicitis, your peritonitis. Chronic is our UC, our ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, and diverticulitis. So appendicitis is the most common surgical emergency of the abdomen. Um, it is caused by an obstruction, usually a fecal mass um, or some type of viral infection that causes the appendix to get angry and inflamed and infected and potentially can burst, which is bad. Um, appendicitis occurs more commonly in men in their 20s and 30s, um, and it is characterized by a right lower quadrant stabbing pain. This has that rebound tenderness where if you push down on the belly, they're okay, but as soon as you let go, it's like, ah. So appendicitis, if they have a fever, that right lower quadrant pain, our mind needs to be thinking that. They'll do some imaging and they'll determine what's going to happen. The appendix is useless. It has no use for us anymore. I think it had something to do with like digestion of sticks at some point. But I always say like when something is useless, it's as useless as an appendix because all it does is cause problems. Um, so we start them on antibiotics if it's infected and inflamed, and we prepare them for surgery. Um, surgery is usually done laparoscopically. It's pretty quick, a couple teeny tiny incisions, snip, snip, sew up, they're good to go. They can also do it open depending on what's going on. Um, peritonitis is basically a hole in our GI tract that means we're leaking stool into that abdominal cavity. So the peritoneum is the lining of the abdominal cavity. It gets inflamed and irritated because something else is going on there. Peptic ulcer, if it perforates, it can cause peritonitis. If that appendix bursts and we're leaking fecal matter into the, uh, into the abdominal cavity, that can cause peritonitis. Um, when you guys talk about renal disease and you learn about um, peritoneal dialysis, a little catheter gets placed into the peritoneum, fluid gets put in and taken out. If that gets infected, that can cause peritonitis. So it is characterized by abdominal pain, and then they'll also have signs and symptoms of infection. Fever, abdominal pain, weakness, 
sweating, cold skin, um, rigid board-like abdomen are all signs and symptoms of peritonitis. This can be life-threatening. We need to treat the infection as soon as possible. And then gastroenteritis, this is some kind of infection. Usually it's something like you had the water in Mexico, traveler's diarrhea. You came in contact with something, your body does not like it, you're infected with something, you have nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. This is self-limiting. We treat it by just taking care of the symptoms. Um, gastroenteritis typically is, we get over it, okay? However, it can be life-threatening in the elderly or debilitated patient because of dehydration or electrolyte loss. But typically, we recover from this quite nicely. Uh, any questions on the acute stuff? <clears throat> All right. So our three chronic conditions, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, and diverticulitis. So ulcerative colitis is when the inside of the large intestine, aka the colon, is very swollen and very red. Abscesses can form, little ulcers can form, changes of the cells inside the intestine are going to occur, which can lead to cancer, um, but there'll be recurrent attacks of bloody diarrhea containing pus and mucus, abdominal pain, weight loss, weakness. Um, they think that this is an abnormal immune response to the GI tract. So you see primarily is in the large intestine. Crohn's disease is a regional inflammation of any part of the GI tract. So think about what the GI tract entails, mouth to anus, anywhere in there. Um, so it can involve that entire tract. It can cause lesions to occur, um, a lot of inflammation, a lot of absorption of nutrients. Um, Crohn's disease is characterized by what we call cobblestoning. So inside the colon, it looks like the old streets that were brick, you know? Um, so inside the intestine, that's what they'd see if they did a scope versus just the smooth surface of it. Um, there'll be epis diarrhea occurring, fat in the stool, and right lower quadrant pain. The other condition, diverticulite, diverticulitis. You have to understand what happens first. So inside your colon, these little pouches can form. They're called diverticula. They look like kind of like little, they're little, what's a good word for it? Little balloons or pouch, like little things that form off of the intestine. They're not supposed to be there. The fact that they exist, their little name is a diverticula. The disease that they're present is called diverticulosis. When these little diverticula get infected, then we have diverticulitis. So those little pouches get inflamed um, and they can cause fatal obstructions or hemorrhage. So like undigested food and things can get mixed in there and cause a lot of lower abdominal pain and a lot of discomfort. So the little pouches are called diverticula. The fact that they're there is diverticulosis, but when they get infected, then you have diverticulitis, okay? So what do we expect? With UC, left lower quadrant pain and cramping, they are going to have up to 15 to 20 diarrheal stools in a day with blood, mucus, and pus present. Also have the presence of rectal bleeding. This is not a comfortable disorder to have. Crohn's has more right lower quadrant abdominal pain. It says diarrhea up to five times a day. It can definitely be more, but it doesn't have the blood component in it because UC has like ulcers. So it makes sense that it's bleeding. Um, both of them will have fever, weight loss, not wanting to eat, 
and it will be, it's a lifetime struggle. So they'll be totally fine for a while and be in remission and then something will kickstart it and boom, we have a flare up. Diverticulitis is left lower quadrant, nausea, vomiting, chills, weakness, and some diarrhea and really not wanting to eat as much. It doesn't have the frequency of stools or the blood in the stools, but it has a lot of similar symptoms of just ickiness. So to diagnose these detailed H and P stool tests, we're going to look at their blood work. Our H and H is going to be low in all three of these. Our sed rate is going to be elevated because all three are inflammatory disorders. So it makes sense that our, our inflammatory markers would be elevated. Um, all will test positive for blood. Um, issues with electrolytes and malnutrition with UC and Crohn's. So our electrolytes are gonna be off there. Um, and then we have some issues with protein with UC and Crohn's. All of these are diagnosed through colonoscopies and some additional imaging can help as well, depending on what they're looking for. Um, Crohn's and diverticulitis, they'll do more ultrasounds looking for fistulas or the diverticular pouches in general, and you also have an MRI. Um, but all three can be diagnosed with colonoscopy and the lower GI prep or the lower GI series. So they get the cold, they get the bowel prep, and then they get that um, enema full of barium to kind of see what's going on. People that suffer from any of these diseases will have multiple colonoscopies in their lifetime, sometimes a few in a year. So we really want to prevent anything bad from happening to them. So they have to do that imaging more frequently. The big bad scary things that can happen is potentially colectomies where we're going to remove part of the large intestine if it becomes way too damaged because of ulcers um, or it's not healing, they might have to remove it. Um, in worst case scenario with ulcerative colitis, they'd have to do an ileostomy, which means the, the ostomy would be in the small intestine, completely leaving that big intestine, um, the large intestine to heal or not be used at all. Um, bowel rest is important with these patients, especially with UC because stool will constantly aggravate and digestion will constantly aggravate. So a lot of these patients are on TPN at some point, which we'll get to in a second. The meds for UC and Crohn's can differ. There isn't a one size fits all, but we do use steroids for acute exacerbations, and then immunosuppressants and immunomodulators to help control the disease. So Humira, which its generic name I cannot pronounce, but be able to recognize it. Um, and then like our anti-rejection medications or uh, immunosuppressants, we're prone to infection. So we want to um, avoid crowds, wear masks, hand hygiene, that sort of thing. If they're on these meds, we don't want them to also get sick because that can exacerbate the flare. Um, patients that have any of these diseases are going to know a whole lot more about it than you are. But we wanna make sure that we educate them on signs and symptoms of electrolyte imbalances. What does low potassium look like? What does low sodium look like? Do they know how to give their meds? If they are giving themselves Humira injections, do they know how to do it properly? <clears throat> what diet changes do they need to make? That's gonna be significant for patients with these inflammatory disorders. Um, if they have TPN, how is TPN administered? IV. Central, through central. a central line. Central line. Through a central line. So people with central lines, high risk for infection because it's a central venous catheter. We're, we're right there. Plus you might be on some medications that are going to reduce your immune system. High, high risk for getting infection. 
But TPN, by going through the central line, bypasses the gut. It will allow things to heal and restore. And then our patients are still getting the nutrition that they need. Um, so things to consider and to be on the lookout for. With diverticulitis, <clears throat> these patients, if they're having a really bad flare, we typically keep them NPO, antibiotics, fluids, that sort of thing. Um, we want to make sure that they take all their meds. If they are on a quinolone, like ciprofloxacin, monitor for any type of tendon pain, especially the heel. If your patient is on Cipro and develops heel pain, that's a sign of impending Achilles rupture. That's a big, bad, scary thing that can happen. Um, but these are common meds used to treat diverticulitis. These patients may also have an NG tube to help remove things from the system and make things move along a little bit easier. Um, and then the big thing with education is going to be about diet, okay? So your patients need to understand the diet changes that come along with, with their diet. People that have UC and Crohn's know what they can eat and what they can't eat. But you guys have to know this too. So with UC and Crohn's, we want to increase their protein. We want to increase their calories because we need to promote healing, but we're going to decrease their fiber. These patients need to be on a low residue diet. So we're actually going to decrease their fiber. No alcohol, no caffeine, small frequent meals. With our diverticulitis, so those little in infected diverticula, we start with a clear liquid diet, and then we're going to progress to a low fiber and then increase to a high fiber. The big thing with diverticulitis is we want to avoid anything that the body does not digest well. Popcorn, seeds, um, any type of nuts, those little pieces that the, the doesn't digest get stuck in the diverticula and cause the infection. So popcorn is a big one. If people have diverticulosis, no popcorn. You've had popcorn stuck in your teeth, those little hulls, those will get stuck in those pouches and cause an infection. Um, we also want them to have regular bowel movements, move things along. <coughs> Um, and then the complications, peritonitis, if we have leaking of stool fluid, uh, stool into the peritoneal cavity, um, any type of electrolyte imbalance that comes along with, de with, um, diarrhea, any type of fistula formation, so they have abdominal pain, um, signs and symptoms of infection, and then that toxic megacolon. All right, let's do a full question here. I think I lost some of you guys. All right, so what are we gonna do for diet? We need to start low and progress to a high fiber diet. We don't want them to have indigestible materials and we're not gonna start with high. We need to gradually increase it. Okay. Questions on the inflammatory? Would they, would they just have a low hemoglobin and hematocrit due to that possible bleeding? Bleeding and dehydration issues because of the 
um, because of the di the diarrhea, but usually more the bleeding. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> All right. So celiac is a disease in and of itself. Um, this is thought to be an um, autoimmune disorder. It's the reaction to gluten. It cannot process it properly. So people that have celiac disease cannot digest gluten. Um, so in a normal gut, we have our little happy villi up, they're moving, everything is great. They help with digestion, woo hoo. With people that have celiacs and eat gluten, it causes the, the villi to atrophy. So it'll decrease the amount of enzymes that are needed to digest it. So they don't have enough of it. People with celiacs, when they come in contact with gluten, will just feel crummy. They'll have issues with diarrhea, abdominal distension and cramping. They don't want to eat. Um, they'll have gas issues. Weight loss is a big thing. Um, and then they'll also be at risk for developing pernicious anemia. So they're going to have things like malaise, that red shiny tongue, pins and needles, that sort of thing. So to diagnose celiac disease, they'll have um, immunoglobulin testing done. They can also do an upper GI biopsy. Um, but truly the treatment for celiac disease is to avoid gluten, not just in what you eat, but the products too, okay? The first time I saw shampoo gluten-free, I'm like, who eat shampoo? but the absorption can cause issues into the skin as well. So truly the treatment is to avoid the gluten. People that have celiacs, when they come in contact with it, they know it, they can feel it, they feel like crap. Um, and truly the only way to not have issues is to avoid it altogether. So we wanna make sure that we set them up with GI so that they know what choices they need to make for food. So avoiding those wheat, products um, and anything that comes along with that. All right. And then briefly, we'll talk about GI bleeds. So we have upper and we have lower. The key difference to determining if it's an upper or a GI bleed is the characteristics of the blood. So wherever the blood looks like blood the most, it's going to be bright red, will tell you if it's upper or lower. So if it's coming out of the mouth bright red, it's an upper GI bleed. If it's coming out of the rectum bright red, it's going to be a lower GI bleed. GI bleeds, they have a certain smell about them. If you've not experienced one, just wait. There's just an odor associated with that. I don't know if it's the blood, if it's the stool, or what it is, but you can smell it. Um, so upper GI bleeds are going to be things like esophageal varices that have ruptured or an ulcer that has ruptured. We're going to be coughing up or vomiting up blood. Um, the stool is going to be dark, tarry, that melana, because it has to go through the whole digestion tract. So it's going to lose that red color and be dark and icky and partially digested. We diagnose um, an upper GI bleed through an EGD. Lower GI bleed causes are going to be things like ulcerative colitis, um, polyps in the large in the large intestine, or any type of perforation that can occur. The stool is going to be bright red in color, frank red blood. Okay, hematochesia. So. It'll be real no. And then if they are to vomit, they're going to have coffee ground emesis because the blood has to work its way back up to the stomach. It loses some of that characteristics and it, it really does look like coffee grounds. Mm -hmm. We diagnose a lower GI bleed with an, a colonoscopy. Um, the treatment for both is going to be protonics and octreotide and then they'll clip and band to try to find the bleed wherever it is. I had a patient once who I put him on a commode. He was having blood in his stool. And when he got up, there was just 
so much blood in the commode. I laid him down. I called the provider, got IVs going, fluids going. They ordered blood. They ended up taking him up to go do imaging, like to do a colonoscopy. And he had an arterial rectal bleed. That was, that was interesting. Um, but they clipped it and took care of it. And I think everything worked out okay. But um, again, wherever the blood is coming from, mouth or butt is gonna tell you where the bleed is. Uh, okay, let's do an ordering question. So you would want to, oh yeah, obtain a health history and then auscultate, or no, then inspect, then auscultate, then like touch it. Okay. So Why inspect. Why would want the health history first? Be... Like there's anything else going on? Yeah, and so we know what to look for or listen to. You know, if they're telling me that my pain is in my right lower quadrant, like, I can listen to things, or if I have not been pooping in three days, I can expect hypoactive bowel sounds or something like that. It's going to give us information to what to look for and what potentially is going on, because what they report plus what we assess is going to help us figure out what's going on with the patient and what we're going to do. So, yep, we're going to look, or we're going to talk to them first. Tell me about what's going on. Get that health history. Then we look. Then we listen. And then we touch. <clears throat> All right. Let's go ahead then and do a couple more poll questions. Do, 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 do. Please ignore the last four options. Ignore upper GI, sigmoid, large intestine, anus. The question did not copy over correctly, so you have four options that are not even part of this question. Get that thing out of there. It's done. Yeah. Do you have socks that don't have a hole in them? Yeah. Okay. All right, so diverticular disease, constipation, what are treatments that we would anticipate? So if they have constipation, do we anticipate them increasing their water? Yes, we want fluids, right? To help hydrate the stool and make it easier to pass. So yeah, increased fiber, 100%. Primary treatment of constipation is going to be to increase that fiber. Anticholinergic medications, no, those are going to decrease peristalsis and lead to constipation. So we'd want to avoid those. Stool softeners, absolutely. And then NPO, we really don't have any indication for being NPO. We're not going to tell them not to eat. They're probably not going to want to because they're so full that they're like, there's no room and they're going to not eat as much, but there's no indication for being NPO with constipation. Bowel obstruction, yes. Constipation, no. 
Okay, I have a little bit of a question for the increased fiber since you were talking about how they like move from having not very much fiber to a lot. Would the, that just be like educating them to avoid certain things like the popcorn and nuts and stuff to avoid getting diverticulitis since they're diagnosed with diverticulosis right now? So the diet progresses. So we're going to anticipate that we're going to increase over time. Mm -hmm. Is kind of the best way to look at it. But, but we're looking at constipation. So how do we treat constipation? Increased fiber, increased water, increased movement, you know, mm -hmm. increased parasites will soften but things that way. Again, would we still want them to like avoid the certain types of fiber to like avoid getting diverticulitis? Or is the fact that they have diverticulosis like a moot point for this question? It's kind of it's kind of a moot point because Okay. We, we <laughs> I was thinking fiber, about it too much then. Like this, when they actually have the infection we limit the fiber, but with diverticulosis, though they're present, but they're fine. They're not doing any issues, but we wanna prevent constipation from happening. So mm -hmm. this is an indication of understanding the difference between diverticulosis and diverticulitis. Because but don't it, we want to like be prophylactic in avoiding diverticulitis or so like avoiding the things that can be stuck in those little right, um, but that's, And those are indigestible, foods and they're not always just fiber that are associated anything indigestible doesn't necessarily okay. mean fiber so, so just educating them to avoid that and then yes. increase fiber but avoid the things food. that aren't digestible mm -hmm. okay cool I was just thinking about it too much and wanted to like clarify <laughs> not a problem yeah if they actually had the diverticulitis then we would be limiting fiber but at this point, they just have diverticulosis. They're constipated. So we want to prevent constipation from happening. So we need to increase the fiber because if constipation occurs, it can lead to obstructions or infection of those diverticula. And then we have diverticulitis. So control is a big thing with diverticulosis. <clears throat> That's a good question. All right, so let's think back to GERD. Okay, so we have GERD. What medications would we anticipate for GERD? Antiacid. Antiacid, absolutely. Oh, your face made me nervous. <laughs> it's like I am well. No, I was, for I was sure. Talking. Nobody. <laughs> Uh, like nobody answered for like 10 seconds so that's when I decide like I'm gonna move on but then mm -hmm. all of a sudden something popped in and I was like oh wait <laughs> mm -hmm. so and acids 100 histamine twos yep that's you like your famotidine opioids not on your life buddy we are not giving opioids for GERD fiber laxatives that's not for GERD that'd be for constipation but PPIs 100 percent so antacids, histamine 2, PPIs. And then there was also like the carefate and what else was on there? I forget. I think that was it.
So William, you asked about stool transplants. Um, stool transplants are used for C. diff infections more than anything else. Um, and not every place does them. Um, they wouldn't do stool transplants for anything other than that. And it's just basically reintroducing that bacteria to the gut to help stop it. And it's usually with chronic C. diff, like we are not able to be getting rid of it. And they can either encapsulate the stool or they can put an NG tube in and then put the stool in through that way. But that would be for C. diff. Okay. Um, so we have constipation, vomiting, abdominal cramping. What are we concerned about? And that is going to be of the options here your intestinal obstruction. So it's like small bowel or large bowel. Ulcerative colitis wouldn't have those presents. They'd be lots and lots of stooling. Okay, oops. Couple more here. All right, so we have streaking in the quad, no, um, streaking of blood in the stool, and that is going to be hemorrhoids. Upper GI bleed would be dark, dark, dark tarry stools. My 15 year old has now listened to this lecture four times and I bet you he's retained nothing. He's also playing video games, so. All right, so what happens when they bear down? So when they bear down, that is going to increase the intrathoracic pressure, which will collapse the blood flow and decrease the cardiac output. And that's why they don't pass out. I didn't show that, sorry. If they engorge something, that means it's gonna get full, so they would not lose blood flow. Why these little question marks are there, I don't know. Yes. 
so when well it's not so much yeah they just cut off blood flow and they pass out um it decreases the blood flow to everything and then that would happen this also happens when people like lift weights that are too heavy when they strain you might have seen videos or stuff of people like trying to deadlift something way too heavy and then they pass out it's that same thing um okay peptic ulcer how would we describe it it is the erosion of the lining of the stomach or intestine inflammation of the lining is gastritis um and bleeding from the mucosa um occurs from erosion. All right, last but not least. <clears throat> All righty. So if they need vitamin B12 injections every month, what disease are we thinking that they already have? That's what this is asking. And that is going to be chronic gastritis. Um, the other ones aren't going to destroy the intrinsic factor in the stomach, but the chronic gastritis would. All right, questions about anything? Right. Well, that is all I have for you guys then. So um, enjoy the last like half an hour or so back. Go take a break if you got peds, otherwise end your day. Um, yeah, that's all I got. It's been a pleasure, everyone. I wish you nothing but success and good luck in the future. Thank you. 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 You're the best. <laughs> Thanks, guys.